Let me just follow on this. Another question that came in. Uh, how would you advise a young government aide to observe Shabbat? We work for non-Sabbath observers who hold staff meetings on Shabbat for their senior staff. Should we turn down these jobs or promotions? Should we go to these meetings? I'm not asking you to give the psaq, but in terms of your assessment of you know the, the culture and what it is, and I think maybe to, maybe to sharpen, I think what maybe to play devil's advocate, I can imagine someone saying, "Well, you're the senator." So, first of all, you can say when the meeting is or isn't going to be, and someone will probably drive you into the Capitol uh, if you need to make that decision, and it won't be directly on you. What about someone who maybe hopes to be a senator someday, but as they're working their way up whatever hierarchy, seem to find themselves in situations that are less in their control? What kind of advice on a, on a career level in terms of religious integrity would you give? Well, I mean, this this case, I know that there are a lot of people who have gone before you who have worked this out. And now, I suppose if you're really concerned about it, you should tell your employer um, what the what personal rules you go by. But here's where my experience in the general society, in which I found non-Jews respect the observance uh, of, of a religious practice, but generally speaking, your, your employer will accommodate you. But what I'm trying to say is I know of uh, a lot of Sabbath observant employees of the federal government and employees of Congress whose employers know that they won't come to meetings on uh, Shabbat. And uh, hopefully, as I always say to my constituents, I, I, I promise you I'll work harder on the other six days. <laughs> uh, and uh, they usually do. Right. I'll go to another a little bit difficult question that's been that's been of interest in me in thinking about this. Um, and it's a question really of what Shabbat has to say to the general society and how much the Jewish Shabbat actually translates. Um, a lot of the audience for this book, as you alluded to, is not just the Jewish community, but the religiously and spiritually inclined <coughs> Gentile population in America. Uh, and in the course of making the case for the Sabbath to this group, you say some interesting things. Just one quote here. This book is for both Jews and non-Jews, whatever their personal religious observances may be, because the fourth commandment and its gift of Sabbath rest were given to all, pe to all people. As soon as I read this line, I started saying, right? All the lines from the davening on Shabbat morning that essentially say, this was not given to the nations of the world. This was not given to the uncircumcised. This is the sign. Beni uven bene Israel between God and the Jewish people, a distinctive relationship. And even you know, these striking statements that go beyond this, where you have you know, one famous uh, rabbinic statement uh, played out in Dvari Rabbi that's most uh, developed, that a Gentile who observes the Shabbat is liable to the death penalty. And just to give you this kind of midrashic take, I think it's such an amazing uh, text, the text asks, why would you say that? The text is almost surprised at itself. And it says, imagine a case where a, a man and a woman of high rank are sitting discussing some intimate uh, issue. And someone comes and sticks their head in and says, I have an opinion about this. What would happen to them? They'd be executed on the spot. <laughs> so too, God said to B'nai Israel, Oti b'ni u'b'neichem, this is our kind of private communion. And now someone else is going to come in and observe our Sabbath. It's breaking up the intimate space between God and us. So I wonder if you have thoughts on this sort of tension, and I'll, I'll phrase it in this way, not so much on, on Dvarim Rabbah, but on the, on the broader question of, I do think there's, there's some interesting tension here between, on the one hand, there clearly being this universalist thrust, um, the, the vision of a society that doesn't have slaves, um, that lies at the heart of this, that clearly has some broader play than just the people of Israel. And yet, on the other hand, there being something very parochial, um, in a positive way, about Shabbat. Have you experienced that kind of split, the aspects of Shabbat that feel very universalist, as opposed to some aspects that feel actually like they're deeply covenantally Jewish, maybe even almost exclusively so? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, great observations. Uh, obviously, in the long history of the Jewish people, there have been a lot of voices, including among those who write uh, to be low. Uh, it seems to me that there is a real is the right word, but there's a there's a duality 
to uh, our sense of ourselves as Jews coming out of uh, Tanakh. And it is this combination that we were chosen. Um, of course, we uh, accepted the, the being chosen. But we were chosen uh, for the purpose of uh, accepting the Torah, the commandments, and living by them. But then also that, that we're supposed to be a light unto the nations. I mean, and and uh, just a lot of narrative through the uh, Torah, Torah and Tanakh. This is, the standard is held up that we are, that, that we do well as Jews when we behave in a way that brings credit, uh, that, that creates an example, if you will, and that brings credit to us as well as to uh, Hashem. So I don't know that I can resolve this. Uh, obviously, um, well, to me, anyway, obviously, the, the Sabbath that, that Christians and Muslims two other great monotheistic faiths, as we say, observe, uh, does take its uh, origin from, from the fourth commandment, from uh, the Jewish observance of the Sabbath. And um, there is a kind of, not only theological power to it, but there is a, seems to be a kind of human naturalness to it, which we've uh, gotten away from. So it's probably as good as I can yeah, no, it's a, I, I throw it out as much for, for yeah. us all to think about that. I think it's an interesting uh, duality, our own observance. And I, and I will say that just quickly, to go back to the questions you've raised before, that I'm, I, I, I'm writing, in the book, I invite the reader to come with us and me and our family through a typical Sabbath. And we, we do the book uh, in order. It starts with Arab Shabbat and goes through Abdullah and people going, and going back to work. Um, so part of it is to explain what observant Jews do on Sabbath, but part of it clearly is to encourage people, whether they're Jewish or not, and whether they're observant Jews or not, to try to accept some of the gift of Sabbath for us. And here, I'm, I'm obviously not a rabbi, I'm an observant Jew, but I am also a senator, and I'm trying to make a, a point about the larger value, as, you, as your, your comments and questions illuminated earlier, um, of how, how much I think our, our, so many individuals and our society as a whole needs to take some rest. Uh, we have time for just about two, two final questions. One I want to cull from a couple that came in, and then one final one of my own. Um, one thread that emerged here from a number of questions was, uh, engage in, which you do in the book briefly, the struggle not to observe Shabbat, the temptation not to observe Shabbat. Um, you've come to a kind of uh, stasis where you have a basic method of navigating it. Um, and kind of interested in hearing uh, about earlier points where that might not have been so self-evident. It might have felt like it was you know, tempting not to observe Shabbat. You write in the book having an earlier point in life of that not being a given part of your practice. Um, and to sort of reflect on what ultimately was able to bring you to a stable and committed place that you're in now, both in terms of what it was from your upbringing that shored yeah. you up in that way, and also in terms of any specific Shabbat experiences that were just so uplifting and magnetic that they yeah. brought you forward. So I was raised in a Sabbath observant family, and as I say in the book, I understand that part of the appeal of the Sabbath to me is, uh, is not uh, uh, theological or spiritual. I associate it with something as non-spiritual but important as the good smells in the home when I came home on Friday and my grandmother and mother had been cooking. And I still get into that. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that it was a family time, you know, uh, very, uh, was very important. Um, I can't say that I always experienced Sabbath nonetheless as a gift. I mean, there were certain times in my childhood when my uh, friends were going off to, you know, sports events or movies or other things on Shabbat where uh, I wish I could have gone, but that just wasn't accepted by my parents, and I didn't go. Then when I went to college, I stopped observing Shabbat. <coughs> Boom! Freshman year, probably the first week I was there. Uh, and as I look back at it, I, I suppose I, I must have been rebelling against, you know, I was free now, I was out. Now, go to figure out why I continue to put on Twill and, and try to observe Kashrut. Um, 
But part of it was that I was uh, a bit, I, I was fearful I was not going to be, I, I was fearful I was actually going to be kicked out of Yale. And I wouldn't be able to make it. I didn't realize until at the end of my freshman year, or actually later, that you really have to work to be kicked out of these places. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get in, and you know, really getting bad grades was not enough. It was something truly offensive. Um, so I, I went through college and law school that way, and then um, uh, after I got married and, and uh, first child was coming along, coincided with the death of my grandma. My grandmother was a very important person in my life. My mother's mother, she lived with us, we lived with her at the beginning. And, um, you know, she was really, in many ways, a benign, warm, wise person. She was kind of a symbol to me of religiosity, but also, when she died, I realized, in a, in a way that was not very profound at all, really, but it was profound to me, that she was my link to Jewish history. She was from the old country. And now um, I had a choice to make, you know. Was I going to um, sort of fill the gap in the chain of Jewish history, uh, uh, or was I not? Uh, uh, and um, the very next Shabbat, I had lived for a year and a half, almost, right across the street from an Orthodox synagogue. I had never been into it. <laughs> and I just decided that first Shabbat I wanted to go in. Uh, for the reasons I've described. And then I, little by little, we came back to full observance uh, in the next year or two. Uh, and then once I was on that path, I, I was on the Dara. I was on the Dara. And, uh, so I now, and then I really, as time went on, and, and counterintuitively, as I became more busy, I became more de devoted to, and in some sense dependent on Shabbat. Um, as I say in the book, and I think you just alluded to this, um, nonetheless, I don't know as much as I've gained, I feel, from my own observance of Shabbat, that I would do it as well as I, I tried to without halakha. I mean, honestly, I don't know whether I would stop everything at sundown on Friday night if it was not associated with a, a tradition halachic tradition, even a sort of sense of accountability to a higher authority, whatever example. Uh, I just don't know whether I could, so in, in an odd way, and this is a, a tension or another duality throughout Jewish history, uh, it, it is the law and in some sense restrictions that ultimately seem to provide for freedom. Uh, and the best example of it is, of course, borrowing from uh, what my rabbis have taught me over the years, that, that the exodus from Egypt, the, the, this, the redemption of the Jewish people, was only the beginning, really. It was, it was for a purpose. The purpose was the law that, would, would, that was given at Sinai, because otherwise we'd just have freedom and no standards. And uh, ultimately, probably, that, that would lead to the, the uh, abuse and, and uh, limitation, corruption of freedom. I want to close with a final question uh, based on a word and concept that I know is deeply affecting for you, and that is destiny, which you write, around, write about in the book. And uh, wondering if you can do two things in this. One, at the risk of, given our political setting here, of uh, starting our own individual private stoning. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, an interesting intersection between Rob Soloveitchik and Sarah Palin, as mediated by you, uh, which I think will nonetheless be an interesting story uh, that plays into destiny. But by way of inviting you to give us a kind of parting word of what you know, at, at this point in your career and looking back and looking at the present moment and looking forward, what is the destiny of the American Jewish community? By which I don't mean how many people will be here of what stripe by what year, um, but what is its destiny in the way in which you use that word? What is our contribution supposed to be? And if you could say, particularly to the you know many uh, younger folks who will be here learning this week and beyond, uh, we've already kind of displayed a real passion for saying, yeah, I, I'm in, count me in for this story. Um, here's what our job is and our task lying in. 
Well, only because I love you, Robin Tom, if I told you the story. <laughs> so during the 2008 campaign, my walk on the wild side, uh, with my friend John McCain, they asked me to come up to um, Philadelphia one day in the fall, because uh, Governor Palin was um, practicing for her debate with uh, now Vice President Biden. And um, I had met her uh, once before, and I uh, didn't know her very well. Actually, I think I'd been at one campaign event with her before that time. Anyway, they were going through a class, and the reason they asked me is that I had been, uh, obviously I'd run for vice president, and also because I, I focused on national security, homeland security. She hadn't had much experience in that. Anyway, long story short, I think they like that. They like that. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, she was off that day. And it was really, it was, she just seemed almost in the days. I didn't know whether she was tired from the campaign or something was happening. So the campaign managers, the two managers were there, they took a break. This is really a moment. And uh, we all go out in the hallway, and they're in a panic because they think, oh my God, th this is going to be an awful situation. They, they thought, and they, they later actually did this, they, they took her out to uh, uh, McCain's uh, ranch in her home in Arizona and flew her family and baby. She hadn't seen the baby for a while. And, and, but it, uh, so we're out in the hall, and they're, they're kind of anxious about what to do. Steve Schmidt, who was one of the campaign managers, not Jewish, he turns to me and he says, you know, you got something in common with her that none of us have. I said, <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> he said, you're both religious. This was, you gotta know Schmidt. He's a sort of big guy with his hair uh, cut off. So he says, uh, you know, he says, why don't you go in there and, I don't know, pray with her or something. <laughs> Alaska, who had been her chief of staff. So I, I said, how you, how you doing? And she said, you know, I'm just off today. I don't know what, um, I, I, I'm tired and blah, blah, blah. So I, I knew from something I'd read about her that she loved the book of Esther. So I first talked to her about that and, you know, how Esther's moment of doubt, you know, she summoned it because she didn't do it, somebody else would, blah, blah, blah. And oh, they said, that was great. That was so helpful. And I said, you know, forgive me, if you've got a minute more, and I said, you know, I've been reading this book by a great rabbi named Salvechi, and it's, he talks about the difference between the covenant of uh, fate, which is the covenant that God established at, with Abraham, and the covenant of destiny, which God established with Moses uh, at Mount Sinai, and destiny is the law and the attempt to sort of realize the principles of the law, and, and really it's up to us, what we make of ourselves, that's our, that, that's pursuing that uh, destiny, and she, she, she thought that would, she was very interested in that, and thank you very much, made it feel good. So anyway, um, after, I, that story was in the book Game Change, that was the name of the book, right, about the 2008 campaign, and um, Robertson Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein right there, who's the daughter of Rav Soloveitchik, sent uh, Rabbi Menachem Kanak, who's a friend of mine, a copy of the pages from the book. And she wrote, would my father ever have believed it? <laughs> <laughs> the lonely hockey mom of faith. <laughs> I mean, I do really believe that the Jewish people have a destiny. I mean, I think God made some big promises uh, to the Jewish people that we would be an eternal people, that not that life would be easy, and of course it hasn't, um, but that we would return to the state of Israel, and of course that the whole mission was to try to live by the law uh, and to uh, do... Uh, Tikkun Olam, as I say in the book, though we forget, at least in the, in the later version of it, it's Tikkun Olam B'Malchus Shaddai. In other words, to perfect the world under the sovereignty of the Almighty, which to me, 
always means that the values that we take from our belief in creation, everybody has a Mr. God, everybody has to have equal opportunity, uh, values that are carried out here in Makam and uh, that that's the, the special uh, Jewish mission, and that, that the other promises that we've been given about our destiny are wrapped up in our ability to, to live by the law. And um, so I think, you know, that over Jewish history, over American history, Jews have contributed greatly uh, to this country in so many different ways. Uh, it has, I'd say to the, the college students who are here, um, you, we, but <laughs> are members of truly blessed generations of Jews. Because we, for two main reasons. Uh, one is, that we live in America, which has given Jews and everybody else, most everybody else, if you happen to be black, or for a good part of our history, you happen to be a woman, not so much, but eventually, uh, given us more opportunity, more freedom, um, uh, more respect than anywhere else in, the, in our history, except for Israel, when, during the good times. Uh, and of course, we're alive uh, at the time when the state has been recreated. So um, I think our destiny is to, to, we should go forward with confidence that the promises that have, were made have been kept and yet the journey is never ending until we achieve ultimate redemption. Uh, and this is where we come back to the Sabbath because the Sabbath is you know, a taste of, of, um, of uh, eternal life, of the next world, of the messianic time. Um, uh, toward which. Um, are all uh, inspiring, uh, and that we continue to have that faith that we will, we will get there step by step. Uh, and each time we try to take those steps, I think we we do our part to improve not only our own lives and the lives of people closest to us, but the life of, of this country. And so I think the Jewish destiny is uh, integral to the destiny of America. America is a country in, in our, a lot of our documents that um, also loves the word destiny. I'll just say a final word to bring it home in an ecumenical way. There's a, uh, a man named Michael Novak, who's a Catholic social commentator, some might call him a philosopher, a theologian, but he wrote a really uh, fascinating book called on wings, of, on wings of Eagles or On the Wings of Eagles, but it's about the founding values of this country. And he says that uh, too often uh, the, the Credit is given exclusively to the philosophers of, in, of the Enlightenment for motivating the founding generation of Christians who created America and the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. He said they deserve credit, but um, the other major source, the other wing of the American eagle is what he calls the Hebrew Bible. And you know, he makes a fascinating, I think, compelling case, although I probably wasn't too demanding a judge. Now uh, listen to the case he made, that that is true through our history. But here's the point I want to uh, end with, which is he says that one of the great contributions of the Hebrew Bible uh, to um, the human understanding of, of what our, our lives are about and history is about is a country to early, other earlier civilizations that had a circular view of history that the the Jewish, the Hebrew Bible view of history is linear. It's it's going somewhere, uh, either literally or metaphorically to the Holy Land, or etc. And he said that vision is very much that value, <coughs> that sense of destiny and, and linear challenge to constantly improve, to get better, to in a sense to realize the values in the Constitution in our law and practice just as we are challenged as Jews to realize the values of the Torah in halakha and in our, in our lives. So um, I think we have a special mission as Jews and an opportunity to bring our sense of destiny uh, to, to the American vision of destiny and, and benefit both in the process. I want to thank you for being so open and sharing so much this evening, and uh, thank you to everyone here for coming. 
Uh, we can't promise sitting United States Senators every week here at Mahon uh, but we do promise that this is how we talk about Torah, uh, in a deep way, in a way that engages with the world, and in a way that both challenges and uplifts us. I really invite you all, if this is your first time ever here, uh, to come back, visit us both online, but also here in person. Uh, this week is a banner week with all kinds of wonderful lectures uh, going on in the, in the evenings. Uh, and just in general to think of this as a Makom Torah, a place of learning uh, that you can be a part of and that you can support in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Senator Lieberman will be here for a few minutes uh, to sign just a limited number of copies for those who have bought the book uh, or who will buy the book uh, to, uh, to sign uh, copies. Uh, we invite, I know I'll see about 40 of you tomorrow morning for Shafrit at 7.30. Uh, but many of you who are perhaps not yet planning to come should also think of coming. Uh, and uh, we'll be here every week, this every morning this week uh, at 7.30 a.m. Uh, for Shafri, to which you are all invited. Thank you very much.